Here's your window, everyone. Climb through it. You got this. <clears throat> Nearly six years ago, I was in a silent room alone. And I was asking Jesus a question. What is this? What is going on here? What is happening? How do I pray about this? How do you want me to handle this? Now, I wasn't alone because I was the only person in the room. I just happened to be the only person in the room who was conscious. <laughs> Someone who I love very dearly was in the hospital. On the maternity floor, no less. Where you'd expect a place of joy was sorrow. Where you'd expect a place of excitement and babies crying was quiet. And an eerie quiet. The kind you don't want to walk into a room and experience. It was dark, really dark, probably close to 2 a.m. maybe, who knows. And I just got this sense, I'm not sure if it was a voice per se, it wasn't something I heard with my ears, but this is a spirit of death. This is a spirit of death. And my very own wife was passing away in front of me. Jesus, how do I, what's going on? How do I pray about this? How do I even start? What words do I use? I don't know what to do. Help me. I was starting to lack strength. I'd read, whether it was earlier that day or the day before, I'm not sure. Time began to blend together in there. But I had read Job 1 to 4 because I kind of felt prompted to do so. But anytime you feel prompted to read Job, just, you know, take a deep breath and get ready for something, you know? And I'm like... You know, I wasn't that I was not totally unprepared. It wasn't I was totally unprepared. It was that in that second, I thought, there is something else going on here. I had a frog in the kettle kind of situation. And what I thought was going to be a simple trip to the St. John Regional ER turned into one of the most traumatic seasons of my life and of our lives as a family. My son who, by the way, was called by so many medical uh, staff, was called by them to be, like, perfect and good. I mean, it was like James 1.17 was written on his face when he came out the womb. <laughs> good and perfect, good and perfect, good and perfect was what happened um, with my son. He was amazing. He was healthy. He was well. He bonded well. He was well. I mean, he was great. But within about two weeks' time, we wondered if... He was going to have his mom. And the other earlier part of James chapter 1, <laughs> which says, Consider it pure joy when you endure all kinds of trials and tribulations, for you know that the detesting of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance fit its, finish its work in you. And here I was, didn't even know I was getting worked on. <laughs> I needed strength because the battle was not something I could handle on my own, or at all. The battle was the Lord's. And so I asked the one to whom the battle belonged, how do I participate and cooperate with you in the battle that is being waged? And the battle that's being waged in this moment is not only for my wife's life, it's also for my heart in that moment. Will I trust Jesus? Will I lean on his strength to protect and provide for me? Will I follow Jesus and fight the good fight of faith? Will I contend with the forces of evil, not only around me, but which are trying to bubble up within me to overcome me? Am I going to be overcome by evil in this moment? Or am I going to, by the power of the Lord and by the strength of his might, overcome evil with good? Today we're talking about strength. Where do we get our strength from and why the heck do we even need it? I mean, some of us are coming into the space or we're checking in online and we're like, well, I mean, I'm fine. If you are, um, maybe you should ask someone if you're fine, like someone that knows you well and they'll help you know your self-deception really well, okay? Usually people, other people know that you're not well before you do sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Some of you are coming into this space weary, exhausted, burdened, heavy laden. Some of us are coming into this space having been just, come, just, having been just enduring a battle. 
having endured a spiritual conflict or an emotional conflict or a marriage conflict or something. Some of us just come into our Sunday morning worship space today just wondering, man, like, should I even be sitting here after what I just said to my kids in the van all the way here? You know? Some of us are coming into this space never having known Jesus as a deep personal friend or an intimate ally. Some of us are coming into this space or checking in online having no idea that Jesus even wants intimacy with you. Or if there's any cost of your part to make that happen. Wherever we're coming from today, let me be clear. We need strength. We need it bad. Because not only is it hard just to live day to day, it's also near impossible to live day to day without an awareness of the life in which you are living. The life that is Obviously, whether it's on the news or in our family's lives, is consumed by conflict, contention, discord, wickedness, evil, hatred. I mean, just check your social media platform before you come into church someday, and you'll understand, again, we'd be reminded once more that we live in a world at war. We just prayed about the fact that we are experiencing or seeing war being taken place in other countries between flesh and blood enemies. But this conflict of which I'm speaking is not a physical conflict. It is not something that is easily, clearly seen and identified. It is not something very simply fought. It is not something that, is, that we see at all. It is being waged in the unseen realm with very visible and tangible repercussions every day. We live in a world at war Before you draw your first breath or woke up this morning, you were in a world at war. And in fact, before Adam was even born into the earth and his breath was breathed into him and he became a living being, before Jesus was proclaimed by angels and also the prophets hundreds of years before and born into the world, he was born into a world at war. You and I are living in a place that is defined by conflict. And that God says, if you are not aware of it, you are being ready to be taken out, whether emotionally or spiritually or mentally or or otherwise. Your marriages, your relationships with your kids, your career hangs in the balance of whether or not you're going to face the forces of wickedness in this heavenly, in this in this realm in which we live, the unseen realm. Now, Where do we get the strength to face such a conflict? Why do we need the strength? Because we're living in a world at war, and we need that strength in order to face that world at war, to face that conflict, which is not just happening in general somewhere over here or across the sea. It's happening right here, right now, and it's happening in your life. When I was in the hospital room with my wife, dying in the hospital, I was, praise God, aware of this conflict taking place. You can see the ICU waiting room there where I slept at one point. At one point, somebody like took the waiting room that was on that one, on that side, and those those couch chairs kind of pull out a bit, and they're pretty comfy, actually, you know, depending on your standards. But like, those chairs, though, I don't know, I don't know a human being alive with the self-respect to sleep in one of those, you know what I'm saying? So like, at one point, I actually just took a pillow from home and like laid it in front of me and slept on that (laughs) ICU waiting room uh, chair, and I not only endured spiritual conflict in the St. John Regional Hospital, I also saw other people suffering it too. A man named Vincent, whose wife had been told, um, you may not live to see the morning. And here he is with me in that room right over there at two in the morning, wondering if he's going to have another conversation with his spouse. And here I am, having seen my wife come out of a surgery that, that you know, supposedly is going to save her life in a very different situation than him, although I can identify with his fear. And he was enduring a spiritual conflict. All of us are. That's why it's important that we read in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 where we get our strength from for this conflict. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6 about not just, you know, he didn't write an exhaustive list, but he did do a doozy (laughs) in terms of helping us understand how we can be equipped for the conflict in which we are in. He defined who we're facing. He defined who we're facing it with. And he also defined how we not only survive the battle, but thrive in it. So, 
If you have your Bibles with you, or if you have it at home or on your Bible app, um, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start, I believe, in verse 10. So let's go to that uh, slide, I guess. Yeah. <sighs> he says this, a final word. Now keep in mind, this is at the end of the book of Ephesians, right? So a final word here makes sense. He's saying all of this in light of everything he's already defined. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go right into it, okay? And then because we're, we're going to spend some time picking this apart, so if you're like, well, I like it when we read it first. I'm like, well, so do I. <laughs> but it's a busy day today, isn't it? We have a full day. We also have a day in which it's easy to get lost <laughs> in the midst of what we're talking about here. So we want to be intentional with each word that we're seeing in the scriptures today. So Paul starts off and he starts saying this. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. And so, whoa, right away, we get, get, get a lot, okay? Just in these first two verses, as he's setting himself up to get a little deeper into what this conflict means. So verses 10 and 11, a final word. With, with everything that, that Paul has said in the book of Ephesians, that like God predestined us to, to experience the love of God, he, he sent Jesus to be our peace, removing the hostility between those who were God's people and those who were not, making them one new humanity for those who put the trust in him. For those who do put their trust in him, he talked about the revelation of God's love having an effect on the formation of Christ in us through faith. I mean, just having a revelation of God's love for you is, is, is crucial. And so Paul's covered all of this in the letter to the Ephesians. He's talked about family relationships and he's talked about what it means to leave behind the practices of your old life and live as children of light. Leave behind the evil, empty practices of your old self and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of his creator. Live out the life that God has made possible for you. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And so he, after, after getting through a lot of stuff, here Paul gets into this final word. If you don't hear this, he sa he's basically saying, I wouldn't be able to finish this. You need to get this. You need to grasp what's going on here. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, the, the word be strong there is, is a similar word that we see, like, for example, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. And so that's the word strong, the power, the dunamis, the ooh, you know, it's got pay, it's got strength, you know what I'm saying? But it's a strength that's in the Lord. It's a strength that's in the truth revealed about Jesus in the scriptures. It's about our relationship with him. In the Good News translation, I'm pretty sure it says in union with the Lord. A lot of times that comes up if, if Paul says in the Lord. It's not always there, but it often comes up. So Paul's having this, this mindset. You're strong in what? You're strong in the Lord. So before we go any further, make sure you understand this. That the conflict is not the point. The war is not the point. The dealing with demons and praying against evil spirits and dealing with the, uh, even the depression that we have as a result of the spiritual conflict in which we're in. Those things aren't the story, but they're a part of the story and they're a necessary part of our paradigm of our worldview as Christians that if we live outside of it, we get into a lot of mess. And so keep in mind that this is about our strength in the Lord. It's about Jesus. It's about what he's done. It's about what he's made possible. We're going to get more into that. So be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The word power is not the same word. It's not Paul just trying to be poetic here with a cute little couplet. What he's saying is be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And power is essentially the use of strength to become an irresistible force. It's essentially strength put into action. It's a kind of power in which if you were about to be invaded by a very large nation, they are powerful, meaning if we tried to withstand them, we couldn't. And so God's mighty power is the strength in which we need to operate, an operation in which our, our authority comes through our relationship with Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, we can overcome not just one conflict, but every spiritual conflict that comes up in our life. And it's Powerful for demolishing not just one battle, but strongholds in our life that keep us bound spiritually and keep our families bound spiritually and keep even communities bound spiritually. This is the kind of power that if you come in between it and its, and its goal, 
you better plan on getting out of the way. It's the kind of power that is forceful. It can get, overcome anything. And this is the kind of power which, with, with which we, we fight back against Satan and his kingdom. And so put on all of God's armor. Have you ever heard this phrase before? Put on the armor of God. You know? Yeah, Janice has. Praise God. That's great. So put on all, <laughs> put on all of God's armor. What does that mean? Well, I mean, God's essentially saying you've got to be equipped. You want to be strong? You want to, be, you want to withstand this battle? You've got to be equipped. You've got to put on God's armor. So we're going to talk more about that, what that means. And so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Against all the strategies. That word strategies is where we get the word method from. Methodeos or something like that. Okay? So, so it's like the methods or the schemes or the strategies, the way that the devil gets into your life. And keep in mind, this guy's sneaky. This is the one that kind of initiated the process of humanity getting doomed, you know? This is, the, this is the, the character in the scripture who has been part of enticing leaders and leading brothers to murder one another and leading people into not just one problem, but sets of problems that have subsequent generational issues for years and years to come. This is the kind of guy that invented the idea of human trafficking. This is the kind of guy that invented the idea of, of widespread genocide. This character in the scripture is the one against whom we wage war. And it says, you will be able to stand firm against all the methods of the devil. So that word stand firm, it just means to stand. But it also means to stand in the, me- in the midst of a conflict. To be attacked and to deal with it. To, to not only be faced with an issue but to be faced in such a way that you are not the one who is raising the white flag to your enemy, but rather they are the ones who plan to come against you and then as a result are defeated. Think Napoleon fighting a battle in Russia in the winter, okay? It's like not, uh, not ideal. Or any other uh, uh, general or, or strat- strategic you know, uh, uh, warfare wager, <laughs> you know? It's the idea that you are the one that's going to be able to stand firm. So let's continue. So verse 12, we get, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. He continues to sort of define what is our enemy here, what is going on, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So here's the thing. This is a really uncomfortable part of of our Christian faith. Would you agree? Is Is it something that comes up usually at a football game or a dinner, you know? Hey, guys, so glad you're here today. Hey, um, have you been facing the devil lately? <laughs> I sure have, you know? Like, nobody like, usually brings this up. It's not a category that we think in a lot because we're often influenced by our culture, which despiritualizes things most of the time. I remember actually sitting in a, a counseling office, a therapy office, and this is a Christian therapist, by the way, and I was mentioning something about struggling spiritually, To which she responded, well, it really sounds like you're over-spiritualizing what you're going through. And I'm like, bruh, (laughs) come on. Aren't you a Christian therapist? Don't you think in these categories? Isn't there at least one space in your worldview as a therapist where where you include this as part of your dynamic for helping someone who's a Christian deal with the issues in their life? Now, again, the warfare is not the point. Maybe you need a Tylenol. Maybe you do need to go to therapy. You know, maybe you do need to have a conversation with a friend. It's not the devil under every rock. But if you think the devil isn't under any rock ever, that's problematic. You think that your enemy is your spouse? Wake up! Your best friends. That's why you got married in the first place. You think that your, your child who's causing an issue in the home, like that's your enemy? Wake up! It's the person that you love more in the world. Most, most in the world. You think that your best friend who you've fought, like you've, you've fought battles together, you've dealt with issues back to back, side by side for 17 plus years, you think your best friend is your enemy here? Wake up. Keep in mind that you're not the only two people in this room, that you're not the only two people in this relationship, that you're not the only two forces at work here. Remember that if you're in a conflict with something, that you are not only in a conflict of flesh and blood, you're in a conflict which involves spiritual ramifications. And so Paul makes it really clear, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. It's really easy to get into politics or the dynamics of religious division and denominations and this and that and the other thing and completely ignore what's actually going on underneath the surface. I mean, how easy is it to get stuck in Republicans or Democrats or liberals or conservatives or NDP? 
and then be like, oh, yeah, but, you know, the devil, he's not really a character. <laughs> he's not really factoring in. <laughs> it's like, what? You know, why are we so easily swept in with conflicts that every other pagan, unbelieving, atheistic person on planet Earth is swept into? Why is it that even Christians, who you'd expect to see the example of love and the model of Christ-like forgiveness and walking out a life of joy and fulfillment and abundance, why is it that from those very people we see so much of not only participation in political or flesh and blood conflicts, but initiation, people making these problems take place. It's awful because the reality is that we're not fighting a flesh and blood battle. We need to keep our perspective on what's actually going on, which is not physical or relational or mental or political in nature. It is spiritual in nature. So let's keep our eyes fixed on the right things. And so Paul kind of mentions, you know, authorities and evil rulers, mighty powers, etc. There's a lot to that, and we won't get into all of it because there's so much that could get that we could get into with all of these things. But the bottom line is, we're not waging war against each other. We're not waging war against our neighbor who really annoys us. The real conflict that we need to pay attention to as followers of Jesus Christ is the one that's happening on the spiritual realm every day. So he continues. In verse uh, 13, as he continues, he basically mentions more about, okay, now that we've covered that, we're in a conflict. Let's talk about how you survive it. (laughs) And not just survive it, but like really, really get through it and win, okay? Because he says, therefore, as a result of the fact that we're in a spiritual battle, let's put on spiritual armor. Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. Now, There's a lot of different translations to this. This passage is actually really difficult to translate from the Greek to the English. So you'll see a lot of translations divert in a lot of places. I mean, we're going to go through the New Living Translation today. But, like, there's so many ways to to, to basically make all the specifics of this passage work. So we're going to do our best here. Put on every piece of God's armor. Be fully equipped. Don't just stop at one part. Get to all of the parts. Get to all being all covered in every way. So you'll be able to resist the enemy. Now you notice, like, we're already coming up with this thing where it's like, wait a second, I thought that the battle is the Lord's. I thought where I'm supposed to be still and let the Lord fight for me. I didn't know how to do anything. I thought I could just let God take care of it. Hallelujah. Now here's the thing, everybody. God's got it. Yeah, of course. And we do need to trust in Jesus. But to believe genuinely that we have no part in the conflict, that the battle belongs, I mean, the battle belongs to the Lord and you belong to the Lord, which means you're in the mix here. You're active participants in this conflict, not because the battle is yours. Praise God that it isn't. Thankfully, you can get on the bench every once in a while, I'm sure. But frankly, it's very unhelpful for us to think that the battle is only the Lord's. You are hanging in the balance, and you are a participant in what God is actively doing in the world. You are a partner in what God is already up to in the world. And even though it's not about you, and it doesn't all hang on you, and it's not your authority and your name and your power being active, you are still active. So let's keep remembering that as we continue because we are participants in this. So we're going to go through the rest relatively quickly, but the last thing I want to make sure you get clear here is this. After the battle, you will be standing firm. You will still be standing firm. Paul uses a lot of military terms in this passage. Keep in mind, he's writing from a Roman prison. So he's watching these Roman legionnaires walk around here and there and everywhere with their helmets and their swords and their shields, etc. Now, the other thing that he's paying attention to is the military terms that are being voiced as he's living in this prison day in and day out and writing this letter. I'm sure he's got lots of source material. And one of the things that you have to pay attention to in the you will still be standing firm is that other passages say, once you have done everything you can to stand, stand. But that, that, that terminology is actually a military term from the ancient world, which meant that if something is coming against you and they try to take you down, not only are you going to have great defense, you're also going to take them down, every single one of them, which means that after you've done everything to stand, which means you've won the battle, you're going to go to every living opponent on that field and take them out intentionally so that none of them may be able to run to another scout or run to another party or run to another legionnaire, whatever, they won't be able to uh, re- get any reinforcements for their conflict ongoing. They are taken out. 
And that military term is brutal when you think about this passage of scripture where Paul is talking about, oh, the love of Jesus, you know, mature in the Lord, trust in him. And then you get to the end, he's like, now, once you get into this conflict, you're going to take everybody out, every single one. It's going to be bloodshed. It's going to be brutal. All right. Just pay attention because as soon as they come up at you, you're going to, you know, it's that concept of we're not just participants. We're not spectators. We're active participants to the point where if there's any spiritual opponent in our life, we are intentionally paying attention to not only how they're opposing us, but how we're going to oppose them to their end in our life. Now, that doesn't mean we eliminate demonic spirits or that or the other thing, but that when we do have a conflict, a lie that we're believing, a conflict in our marriage, a difficulty with our, our prayer life, our devotional life, our mental life, our emotional life, anything, we don't just let things hang. If somebody were to knock on your door at 2 a.m. and then break in, how tempted would you be to lay down and just be like, yeah, I'm sure it's fine, right? Like, who, who, would, who would do that, you know? Like, I mean, maybe you have, like, a spouse who is, just, you know, raring to go, whatever, and they'll take care of it, and you're like, I'm going to bed. <laughs> That's fine. But generally, if somebody's breaking into your home, they're not actually after something that is not precious. They're after something that is precious. And if you decide to ignore them, you will pay the consequence of that, right? And maybe even with your own life. The enemy has taken out many a solid Christian leader before. The enemy has taken out many a solid Christian marriage before. The enemy has taken out many a solid relationship with one's children before. He's done lots of those things before. And how did he do it? By not standing firm to the very end. Those Christians who have faced those difficulties, those challenges, they didn't root out every aspect of the influence of the evil one on their life and take it out, which is how we're going to talk about Next. Okay, so verse 14. Now we're going to run through this relatively quickly because we don't want to be out here at 1230, do we? Or one o'clock? No, you you probably hit me with a picture fork or something like that. I'm not sure if anyone has anything under their seat. But but he says, stand your ground. So again, stand, stand, stand. So this idea of strength, gird your loins, get everything together. Make sure you are solid, that you are impenetrable and stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. Again, this is another verse that's hard to translate. Essentially, fit yourself with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, right? Verse 16, he continues, In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Now keep in mind, Romans in that day, they didn't have like a teeny weeny buckler, you know, hope, hope. Yeah, something bad's happening. Better keep my shield. No, it was huge. It was like basically the size of this pulpit. And uh, the opponent would often be sh- shooting, not just a regular arrow, which would be bad. Not a little dart, like, you know, like nothing like that. It's a fiery arrow that once it gets into the sky, it starts to get even brighter and more intimidating. And then it hits you and your shield's on fire. So you're on fire and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. And then you panic and you roll over and the enemy comes at you with a spear. You know, that's the strategy, right? So, so the enemy is going to do that same kind of stuff. He's going to make you afraid. He's going to shock you. He's going to use fear tactics. You know, con men that we've seen, whether they be in the news or other places, have used the same kinds of things to get what they want to. Con artists, deceivers, accusers, slanderers. Money grabbers, greedy people, whatever. They do the same kind of things because they're aligned with this kind of person, right? This character. And so the shield of faith not only stops a fiery arrow, the encouragement was to actually like snuff it out and then keep going. And you never ditch your shield because your shield in that moment, even though even if you feel like your faith is on fire, it's not. It's more solid than you think it is. You probably, I know this sounds like an odd thing to say, but you trust Jesus more than you think you do. But the enemy wants you to believe that you don't so that you'll ditch your faith altogether. Are you hearing me? Come on now. So you pick up your shield, you go back at it because your shield is not only for you, it's for your friend next to you. You know, there's a statistic that says if you have a friend who's ever had a divorce before and they're in your immediate circle, you have a 71% chance of also getting a divorce. Did you know that? If you have a friend of a friend who had a divorce, you have a 33% chance, more, more probability of having a divorce than if you didn't. Which means that, oh, like, 
What other people do in my circle matters? Yes, which is why you don't ditch your shield of faith. If you're struggling with your faith, you're struggling with your marriage, you're struggling with difficulties, you don't throw off your faith altogether. You keep that on because it's not just the measure of your faith for the measure of your life. It is also having impacts on the people around you. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So the sword of the Spirit is pretty clear. I mean, Jesus used the word of God from the Old Testament to face the enemy when he came at him. And the enemy did the same kind of stuff that he would do for us. He asked us deceiving questions. He asked Jesus things like, well, if you are the son of God, you could probably do this. So he's basing a deceptive idea on something that Jesus knew was true. And then Jesus hit him again with the word of God over and over and over again with the word of God. He took the offense with the word and banished the enemy away. And you can do the same. You are empowered to do the same through the word of God. So you really got to get some practice with the word of God. You need to get some experience with the word of God. You need to really get into the truth of not just what the word says in general about the world, but also what the, world, what the Bible says about you, that you're adopted, that you're loved, that you're accepted, that you're forgiven. And if you put your trust in Jesus, you not only have the strength of the Lord, but his mighty power to empower you with every conflict that comes your way spiritually. You need to know that because if you don't, the enemy will take you out. He'll sneak up on you with some condemnation or some thought from your fears that you've held inside and keep keep really secret from everybody else, but he'll throw that secret thing right up in your face to take you out. He'll do it because he's done it to me and he'll do it to you. Take up the sword of the spirit and put on the helmet of salvation as your helmet. I mean, salvation as your helmet is simple. I mean, it's not about our mind and our intellect. What Paul is thinking of here is your decision making. Because when, when the Bible talks about head, it talks about like the head. It talks about the leadership. So your body, you know, your head is like your, your director. You know what I'm saying? That's where you assess information and it's where other stuff tries to take you out. And if your head is taken out, it's like a leader is being taken out of the team and they can't go anywhere because they don't have the direction. They don't have the guidance And so for you, make sure you keep on you the truth that you are rescued in the Lord. Keep on you the truth that nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Keep on you the truth that you belong to God and that there is nothing that can pluck you out of his hand. Keep in mind that the only thing that can influence your decisions about where you go, where you be, where you end up, like you are the one who has the ability to put that salvation helmet on so that your decision-making isn't clouded by what the enemy is trying to throw your way. Okay, so verse 18 closes it all off for Paul where he says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. You know, one of the mistakes that we make as Christians is that we stop praying. We don't realize that we're doing it. We sit down to pray and we start worrying our way through prayer. And we get with a friend and they're struggling with something and they're like, and you're like, okay, well, I'll pray for you, Tanya. See ya. And then you totally forget. What if we all made a commitment in our own heart that if somebody was sharing something with us that we would commit to say, can I pray for you right here, right now? Because I mean, it's not that hard, is it? We do it all the time, but we also look at one another as weirdos <laughs> when we do that. And I mean, I've had so many friends say, oh, I think it's really cool that you pray for me, but I really wasn't expecting it. I'm like, you should expect it probably. I mean, especially when you're hanging out with me, but you should definitely expect it just as a Christian in general. If you have Christian friends and every once in a while you have a hangout where you have dinner or whatever and nobody volunteers to pray, maybe we should think that's weird. I was like, wait a second. Did you notice that Tyler didn't pray before we left? That was super awkward. We should bring that up to him, you know? And be like, hey, can we pray together before we leave our small group or our conversation or whatever? Like, I, I would pray for somebody if I was leaving the cash register, you know? Like, and that's not for everyone. Not everybody has that thing where they want to extrovertedly, like, you know, pray for random people that they meet on the street. But at the same time, pray in the Spirit at all times, at every occasion. Every occasion. Every occasion. And stay alert and be persistent in your prayers. Don't let things just drift mentally. Don't let your prayer life fall apart by neglect. Take it as ownership for your life, that not only for yours and for your safety as a follower of Jesus, for your thriving rather, it's also for the thriving of the people around you. It's for all believers everywhere. 
There are times when my mother would tell me, yeah, I woke up in the middle of the night and I didn't know what to do. I just felt so anxious. So I just started praying for Christians in persecuted countries. And then finally, I got the peace to fall asleep. I feel like God really has it on my heart to pray for other Christians in other places. And I won't get rest until I do. Is it possible that maybe the anxiousness that we're feeling isn't about a situation going on in our life? That maybe God is actually putting something on us that we refuse to ask him about that could bring us a lot of joy if we just leaned in and said, God, what do you want me to pray about right now? How do I handle what I'm experiencing in this moment? So that's how he caps it all off. So let's move on to the next slide. Oh, man, I'm so warm. You are living in a world at war. That's the bottom line for Paul. We've covered that, right? You're living in a world at war. So be equipped. That's why it matters so much that you take on this information, that you take on these truths today. Um, so, it, so in the next slide, we kind of talk about more with this, is that in, you're living in a world at war. So let's go to the next slide there, Tracy. If it'll work. Hey, hey, hey. Understanding we were born in a world at war is vital to our transformation in the journey that we're in with Christ. It's absolutely necessary. No, it's not optional. No, it's not an idea of like whether or not we can just, oh, well, you know, it's, everything's going to be fine. It doesn't really matter. Like it does. You have significance. If you take on this issue, you have a significant advantage uh, against the enemy and what he wants to do in your life. And a lot of people think that like this theme of war that we see in the Old Testament, well, God doesn't do that stuff now. And he doesn't expect us to participate in any battles now. Well, actually, that didn't end in the Old Testament. Not at all. And John Eldridge says in one of his books, I think it's in um, Waking Desire, he says, many people think the theme of war ends with the Old Testament, not at all. So let's go to the next slide. So there's this moment in the book of Sam, for Samuel where David is in a conflict in which all of his friends who he's fighting with, his allies, his, his army, have been overcome by another opposing force of the Amalekites. And they come in and they take their wives and their sons and their stuff. And so they show back up from a battle in which they haven't eaten in days. And they come home and everything they've ever loved is gone. And so they're like, well, David, um, you're done, buddy. Let's find a new leader here so we can, you know, deal with this somehow. And so David's kind of freaking out because they're not just talking about firing the guy. They're talking about firing rocks at him to end his life. So, you know, leadership, right? Uh, anyway, so David is greatly distressed because of these men. But David found strength in the Lord his God. David found strength in the Lord his God. There's actually a moment in David's life where at the moment of David and Goliath, you know, around, 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 boo, you know, taking out David and Goliath, that actually before he steps into that moment where he's about to fling a stone at one of the biggest guys he's ever seen in his life, he says, the battle is the Lord's. You will not strike me today. But yet, he's still gathering stones. He's still being equipped He's still walking out ready to go and, and, and prepared for what's about to happen. And so David is not just leaning on that in that David and Goliath moment. He's leaning on it right here, right now. Where in the book of Deuteronomy, there's actually a passage that encourages people who are coming up against this kind of conflict. The priests would come out before being sent out, before the army was sent out of the Israelites to say, today you're going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. So what does that mean? For us today, as New Testament followers of Jesus, fully devoted, understanding the conflict that we're in, it means that the battle that belongs to the Lord, that it's not our power, it's not our prestige. It's not all of our amazing equipment and experiences and education that's empowering us in this moment. It's our relationship with the Lord. And it's the Lord himself working in us and through us to overcome the power of the evil one. And I remember in that moment when I was in the hospital with my wife, there is this situation where I'm like, okay, God, how am I going to handle this now? I know the battle that I'm in. I know that the, the, the straits are dire. I know that we're in a situation that could end us up with me being a single dad. I might have to leave ministry to take care of my son. I might have to do a complete overhaul of everything I've ever known, all while grieving the loss of my best friend in life. And so what goes on from there? What happens in that moment? Well, you have a moment just like I did in that moment where you're either going to lean on your own strength and fall apart, crumble. Or you're going to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. 
you're going to lean on him for the strength you need for this battle. You're going to believe with wholehearted dependence on him that not only is he going to win, you are too. Whether in this life or the life to come, whether it's in the circumstances that you want or the circumstances that you must accept, you are the victor here, not the devil. Not your defeat, not your depression, not death, not grief, not evil, good. So what do we do with this information? So next slide there, Tracy. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. It's not by our power. It's by what Jesus did on the cross for us. By the blood of Jesus Christ, we overcome. We intentionally pray, Jesus, I bring the blood of Jesus. I bring your blood right now into this situation. And I consecrate myself to you. I give myself to you. And with the power of your blood, I bring the truths of what, you've all, what you have accomplished in me against the devil and his intent in my life. So it's not by us. It's not for us. It's not about us. Yes, the battle is the Lord's. But that means that it's his resources. It's his vision. It's his purpose. And you are his soldier in this fight. So I encourage you to participate. So what do we do with this? We choose not to be overcome by evil. We choose instead to be overcomers of evil through good. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, verse 21, there in the next slide, um, that we do not choose to be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now here's the thing. With all of these like armor pieces, all of it depends on what Jesus did. All of it. The righteousness that we receive from God, the love that we receive from him in our salvation, the readiness that comes from us from the gospel of peace, all of it. What's the gospel all about? Jesus. Where, does we, where do we get our righteousness? How, does, how did it come about? Jesus. How do we step into faith? Who are we relying on with our shield of faith? Jesus, you know. And so everything relies upon him and his finished work. And so we're empowered to not be overcome by the evil of this world, but to overcome it with good. So the bottom line here is be equipped. You're in a spiritual battle. There is a spiritual battle at being waged right now for your heart and the heart of everyone you know. So be equipped. There is a battle going on right now, not only for your heart, but for the hearts of everyone you know. So the answer is be equipped. Whatever background you're coming from, whatever lack of agency you've stepped into the Christian faith with, whatever feeling that you've had of being inept, powerless, sad, without any control over the situations of your life, be equipped now. Do what you need to do now. Take on the armor of God now and explore what are you going to do and how are you going to contend with the forces of evil in this world? How are you going to begin now to contend with the forces of evil in this world. Let's go on to the next slide there, Tracy. <sighs> yeah, how are you going to begin <laughs> contending with the forces of evil in your life? So um, what I want to do right, right now with us is uh, I want us actually just to pray. And I want us to pray intentionally in light of everything we've heard right now. It's up to you as to whether or not you're going to contribute to the battles that are in your life. It is not for God to make you do what you need to do. It is not for God to get you up in the middle of the night to face that intruder that's coming against your household. It is up to you as to whether or not you are going to participate instead of spectate in the spiritual battle in which you're in. So let's do it now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you.